welcome to our webinar, Helping People Achieve Financial Stability After Incarceration. This is an excellent opportunity to learn more about the latest resources being offered by the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau. My name is Mary Heidel Haight, the Corrections Project Manager for the Corrections and Reentry Division of the Council of State Governments Justice Center. Supported by the U.S. Departments of Justice's Bureau of Justice Assistance, or BJA, the National Reentry Resource Center is the nation's primary source of information and guidance in reentry. We deliver training and technical assistance to recipients of Second Chance Act grants in order to maximize their efforts to reduce recidivism and help people succeed in their communities after their return from incarceration. Further, the NRRC works to advance the knowledge base of the reentry field, promote what works in reentry, facilitate peer networks and information exchange, and to provide information for people returning to communities and their families. Before we begin, I have a couple of technical notes. If you encounter connection or audio problems during this webinar, please call WebEx Technical Support at 1-866-229-3239. Three, two, three, nine. We will also put that number in the chat box on your screen. Unfortunately, there are some connection issues we may not be able to resolve. However, we are recording today's webinar and it will be posted on our website within two weeks from today's date. Also, we have designated time at the end of the webinar to review questions and answers. At that time, please feel free to type your questions into the Q&A box on your screen. We are fortunate to have with us today Deanna Hoskins, Senior Policy Advisor for the Bureau of Justice Assistance, U.S. Department of Justice. Mary Griffin, a Senior Advisor for the Office of Financial Empowerment of the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau, and Inger Jafrida from ICF International. Here is Deanna Hoskins of BJA. hands and promote the corrections field by administering various programs through federal award assistance to criminal justice agency and community providers, providing training and technical assistance resources covering broad subject areas to the field, assistance through alternatives to a traditional incarceration and other resources. BJA Corrections Programs. Some of the uh, annual corrections focus programs that BJA administer include the following. Second Chance Act. Through the Second Chance Act, BJA supports reentry programs that provide needed training, treatment, and supervision to individuals as they attempt to reenter society. The purpose of these reentry programs is reducing recidivism, incorporating research evidence-based strategies in both pre- and post-release settings, and evaluating the effectiveness and impact of reentry programs across various subject areas. Eligible applicants for these awards include states, local governmental agencies, federally recognized tribes, and nonprofit organizations that support reentry programs to the community. Justice Reinvestment Initiative. JRI is a data-driven approach to reducing corrections and related criminal justice spending and reinvesting savings in strategies designed to increase public safety. States and localities engaging in JRI collect and analyze data on the factors driving the growth in criminal justice populations and costs, identify and implement changes to increase efficiencies, and measure both the fiscal and public safety impact of those changes. We are pleased to offer this webinar introducing the Focus on Reentry Toolkit. Practitioners may utilize this guide in helping those returning to their communities after incarceration to achieve their financial goals. I will now turn the presentation over to Mary Griffin, Senior Advisor with the Office of Financial Empowerment Consumer Financial Protection Bureau. Mary? Um, thank you. Thank you so much, and thank you, Deanna, and uh, Mary Heidel Height, and uh, Keisha Thornton from um, CSG and NRC for inviting us. Um, to, to be able to provide this webinar. Um, I'm Mary Griffin with the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau, as Deanna said, and we're going to provide you with kind of a mini training on a toolkit and reentry guide that we offer. Um, and we always say that we like to provide interactive trainings. So we're going to start right away. I'm going to hand it over to the trainer, 
uh, Inger Jafrida, who we've been working um, as a partner with on this project for years. And we're going to um, get you involved to make sure everyone's awake and um, knows what's going on with this webinar. So, Inger? Great. Thanks so much, Mary. And um, thank you all so much for joining us this afternoon. So we're going to go ahead and launch a poll. That's one of the ways we're going to do participation today. And so the first poll, um, and we're going to give you about 10 to 15 seconds to, to answer this. In your opinion, what's the most important role that financial empowerment can play in an individual's life as they plan for reentry and actively rejoin the community outside of jail or prison? Do you think it's A, um, helping individuals have conversations with other about others about financial issues, helping individuals set goals and show them how money helps them reach those goals, help them deal with court-related or other debts, helping individuals budget and manage their money, helping individuals get, understand, and potentially remediate their credit reports, or help them get, understand, and remediate their background screening reports, or is there something else? So go ahead and enter what you think is the most important role for financial empowerment, and in um, just a couple seconds we'll sort of reveal um, what you what, what the results are of our poll. So, Kicha, do you want to go ahead and show the results of the poll? And I think you're going to have to share. I'm not seeing them, so if you could say what they are, that would be terrific. If you give me one minute, it's just initializing right now. Sure, no problem. And if you haven't voted, you okay, here we go, excellent. So it looks like the, um, the vast majority of you said something else. Um, and so unfortunately, we can't see those. But if you have thoughts about what those other things are, feel free to put them in the chat box. Um, the next two areas were helping individuals budget, manage their money, followed by helping individuals set goals and show them how money helps them reach those goals. That's really, really interesting. And then we had a few, few votes for everything else, but no votes around um, uh, getting and understanding credit reports, which I also think is really interesting. Super. Well, one of the things that you'll see is that the toolkit, Your Money, Your Goals, as well as the Focus on Reentry Companion Guide actually address all of these issues, A through G, as well as others. Um, and so that's really gives us sort of a sense of what are your biggest priorities or what you think are the priorities for the people that you serve. So our objectives today, and thank you so much for participating in the poll, I should say that as well. So our objectives for today are really to introduce you to the CFPB, the Office of Financial Empowerment, and key resources provided by not only the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau, but particularly the Office of Financial Empowerment. Um, so we'll give you an orientation to the Your Money, Your Goals Toolkit, as well as the Focus on Reentry Companion Guide, so that you can use those resources potentially in the work that you do with um, justice-involved individuals. And then finally, we'll spend some time exploring financial empowerment topics more in depth by looking at some of the tools and information that, again, can be found in both the toolkit as well as the Focus on Reentry Companion Guide. So, of course, we need to begin with an introduction to the CFPB so you understand a little bit about this agency if you don't already know a lot about it, um, as well as its motivation behind doing these or introducing these kinds of resources. And for that, I'm going to kick it back over to Mary Griffin. Mary? Hi, Inger, um, and thanks for participating in that poll. It really, it really helps us kind of think about, about what our audience needs and, and how we can help them. Um, the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau, it's a federal government agency created to protect consumers in the wake of the 2008 financial crisis. We aim to make consumer financial markets work for consumers, responsible providers, and the economy as a whole. And we protect consumers from unfair, deceptive, or abusive practices and take action against companies that break the law. We provide people with information and tools to make smart financial decisions. Um, Next slide, please. Thanks. So how do we do that? We kind of um, bucketed our work in three, three ways. You know, we like the ease, I guess. Um, we empower, we enforce, and we educate. So we empower people, by consumers, by creating tools, answering common questions, and providing tips that help consumers navigate their financial choices and shop for the deal that works best for them. 
We also enforce um, the law and we supervise financial institutions, both banks and non-banks. And we take action against predatory companies and practices that violate the law. We've already returned almost $12 billion to an estimated, I think, 26 or 27 million um, consumers we've provided relief to. So we've, um, we've been pretty active over the past few years. We also educate. We encourage financial education and capability from childhood through retirement. We publish research and we educate financial companies about their responsibilities. So um, in terms of the, our Office of Financial Empowerment, um, we're part of the CFPB's Division of Consumer Education and Engagement. So that's the division that is tasked with um, educating and engaging around financial um, consumer finance issues and specific populations. And those populations include older Americans, service members, students, and um, our office. And we focus on low income and vulnerable consumers. Um, we, whether they're unbanked or otherwise vulnerable, um, maybe they have a thin credit file or maybe they're, they're facing particular stresses in their financial life, like so many of the people you work with who have been incarcerated um, face. And we created Your Money, Your Goals to reach these consumers by empowering those that serve them, frontline nonprofit or tribal social service staff, community volunteers, staff and legal aid organizations, and people that serve workers. And providing, by providing these intermediaries with high quality information, we're hoping that they have the tools and resources to start the financial conversation with the individuals they already serve. So we're really trying to leverage resources and channels here. And the training provides them with the confidence to use these tools and resources. And the training um, that some of you, if you're interested, can ultimately um, provide to others in who you work with, other frontline staff, or um, provide to, to the people you work with. Um, so we're going to go to our website. Um, we are a new agency, fairly new, so we like to say we're very digitally driven. So the first place we're going to show you, um, and we just relaunched this page yesterday, so it's um, brand new. Um, this is our Your Money, or Goals page, which connects you to all of our resources um, involved in this toolkit. Um, if you scroll down, you can see um, the, there's a video on some of these um, new products we have, and you can find um, issue-focused tools. You can find the toolkit. You see on the left um, the green toolkit, um, and then we have these issue-focused tools. They're little booklets, um, a lot of fun. Um, they're very popular, and they're related to the tools in the toolkit. And then we have our companion guides, which include um, which includes the reentry guide and also includes a guide for native communities. Um, and just sort of exploring our website because we really do try to drive people to the website, understanding that a lot of people still um, need to order things in print and you're welcome to do that. We have all our materials are available um, from, from the GPO website. And you can, when you go to one, you can click on it and find where you order it if you want to order those tools, um, th those resources. So the next place, um, just to give you some examples, we have what are we call direct-to-consumer tools. So for example, we have um, how to plan to shop for an auto loan, which uh, you as a consumer can work directly with the, the um, website on going through a decision-making process. What we're doing today is we're training on a toolkit that's to be used by frontline staff with others in kind of a one-on-one -on -one setting. But these are what we call our direct-to-consumer tools. We also have a paying for college tool. Um, this auto tool kind of walks you through the decision, what you need, um, the relationship with your credit report, um, financing, and, and other things when you're going to shop for a car to really help people go through that process. Uh, another tool we have is, um, it's called planning for retirement, but it's really about focused on that one decision that is so essential for so many people, and that is when should you claim Social Security. So this is a real easy to use tool. I think there's just a few steps. Um, you put in your date of birth, um, information about your income, 
and you will be provided sort of what what you can expect at the various years, um, including your full retirement years, and you can compare overall the difference between retiring at one age or versus another age. So it's really a great tool in retirement planning, especially for those people, um, so many of, of whom rely um, almost solely on Social Security for their retirement. And then we have, so those are our, some of our direct-to-consumer. And then um, we have other resources um, through our, like, financial education. We have resources for parents and caregivers. So um, if you are working with kids or you know people working with kids, um, we, we kind of have, have done a lot of research on what's effective. We also have this great thing called Money As You Grow, which talks about the, the different types of skill building at different points in a child's life. Um, so what are the types of things you should talk about when they're 6 to 12 versus when they're um, 3 to 6 versus when they're in high school? And um, we've developed a reading club, which is a lot of fun, and you can, you can order these little booklets that accompany um, books for children that, that have as a theme money or saving, um, things like that. And it, it helps you kind of um, read the book with your child so you can, you can kind of, pro it prompts you with questions. Um, it's a great thing. I, I really wish we had this when my kids were little. Um, so here's just an example of some of the books we've already done. It's kind of a book of the month club. Again, all these um, booklets that, that accompany these books, you can um, order for free. So if you're working with any uh, child care programs or anything like that, or just as, as an option for some of the people you work with who may be reuniting with their kids, it's just a wonderful way um, to do that and, and to teach about money, both the parent and the child, um, it can kind of help with money decisions. Um, and then we have for people, you know, if you're working with older adults, um, we, we have resources for older adults. Um, we have an office that, that is really um, working on addressing the financial exploitation issue and kind of scams and, and how to address them. And also just, how, you know, what to look out for and how to make financial decisions as you're getting older. We have a reverse mortgage guide. Um, we have guides about managing someone else's money um, to help uh, people who are might, might be representative payees or powers of attorney, and you know they don't really know. They're given this task to to take care of someone else's money, and they don't know. And these are very plain language um, materials that kind of walk people through what their duties are um, and you know what they should do if they're facing problems. So again, you can download and order them. We have some, we have national ones, and then we have some state-specific ones. Um, and that's just, those are just kind of examples of some of the, the information, resources, and tools we have online. Believe me, there's a lot more, but um, we, I, we could take up the whole, the whole time with it. But it just gives you a sense of how we're trying to connect to consumers in ways that, that empower consumers to take control over their financial lives. We're sort of agnostic a little bit about what their goals should be. We want to help walk them through their own decision-making process. Um, and with that, I'm going to turn it back over to Inger, um, who is going to give you an overview and um, start the training. Thank you so much. Great. Thanks, Mary. That was a great tour um, of the website. really appreciate that. So um, as Mary's already said, your money, your goals, and, and I'm first going to talk about your money, your goals, and then the companion guide because um, the Focus on Randy companion guide is a companion guide to your money, your goals. So it's good to have a little bit of an orientation around what the toolkit, the sort of the foundational toolkit is about. So your money, your goals, as Mary's already said, is both a toolkit and a training. It was really developed to build the financial empowerment capacity of frontline staff and provide them with tools so that they could work directly with the people that they already serve, including justice-involved individuals. And the rationale for that is that individuals who are frontline staff members already have relationships with individuals who need these tools, and they've already got, to some degree, some sort of trust built, which is really the foundation for having honest, open financial empowerment conversations. Um, and so the, the strategy was really sort of a um, train-the-trainer model where we went out, provided training to um, frontline staff who they themselves were willing to go back and train others in the community. And as a result, um, there are well over 16,000 people have been trained 
on the toolkit as well as, um, to a certain extent, um, the, compa uh, to the two companion guides. Um, and so um, one just example, like off the top of my head, would be, you know, like staff at legal aid organizations. There was an effort to really get this out to legal aid organizations. And um, many, many staff, hundreds of staff, received training on using the toolkit, um, and then many of them then in turn turned around and used it to train their own staff or people in their community. Um, and as a result, legal aid staff and their partners are now using the, the toolkit in their work with clients. Um, either on a one-on-one -on -one basis or even in clinics that they host or even in just doing uh, community seminars. And so that's how we've really gotten the toolkit out there. The toolkit is really quite simply organized um, into sort of two big areas. The first are sort of the introductory modules, um, and, um, and that includes an introduction to the toolkit, which you know, has the outcomes that you can expect from using the toolkit. It also includes understanding the situation, and this is where there's a, an assessment called My Money Conversation, or My Money Picture, excuse me, and um, you'll see that there's a very similar tool to that in the Focus on, um, the focus on Reentry Guide. And the, the goal for that is really to help get a snapshot asking just some really um, sort of basic but eye-opening questions um, to the, the person that you may be working with to get a snapshot of what's going on with them financially so that you can better target the materials in the toolkit to what their needs are or what their goals may be. The third section focuses on starting the money conversation. When we first went out and did the initial research for the toolkit before we started writing it or anything, one of the things that we heard over and over again from frontline staff was that just starting that conversation sometimes was so hard. It was awkward. They weren't um, case managers and frontline staff weren't really sure like how to bring it up or they themselves felt like, gee whiz, I don't have my own ha financial house in order. How can I really have this conversation with the people that I'm serving? And so that's really what that section of the toolkit is designed to do, is help sort of start that money conversation and just give some tips, tools, as well as some example scripts to, to help have that happen. And then the fourth um, section of the introductory portion of the toolkit is about sort of the emotional value-based and cultural influences on how it is that we choose to get and use our money. And um, people are often surprised that this is in the toolkit, but we really believe that this is such a foundational part of how people relate to money and the choices that they make with money. So that's the first section. And then the second section of the toolkit are all the content modules. And so this includes um, everything from setting goals and planning for large purchases to um, getting through the month, which is creating a cash flow budget, dealing with debt, all kinds of debt, um, as well as um, just protecting your money, some basic consumer protection. Um, the content modules are set up where the, at the beginning of each module there's some narrative information that really provides some information that maybe if a staff member is new to financial empowerment will help them understand it a little bit better. It also just provides some context for using the tools. And then the second half of every module are actual tools that are designed to be used with clients either on a one-on-one -on -one basis or even in a group setting. And they are really designed and addressed specifically to the client. And you'll see that same setup in the Focus on Reentry Companion Guide. So the goal of Your Money, Your Goals ultimately is to improve outcomes irrespective of the kind of program that you're working in by making it easier for you and other frontline staff to help the people that you serve become more financially empowered. So that's really what your money, your goals is all about. So we're going to go ahead and launch a second pool, poll. Um, and so um, what we'd like to know, in your opinion, which area of someone's life do finances most affect as he or she reenters community following time in jail or prison? So is it stable housing, getting a job, accessing transportation, just generally being able to provide for him or herself, or making and maintaining familial connections, or is it something else altogether? So what do you think um, is the biggest area of someone's life that finances most affect? And so Keisha, if you want to go ahead and close the polls, because we know it takes a minute or two for these uh, to, 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 to tally and be ready for everyone to view. Okay, 
So it looks like, um, again, that there is either uh, that, that the, the, the primary area that you see, and then there's a lot of convergence around this, is number one, um, getting, getting stable housing, and then followed by close second, just generally being able to provide for him or herself. And again, um, those are two things that are very much uh, uh, addressed um, in the toolkit, or at least tools to help people do those things. Great, thank you so much for participating in that poll as well. So um, first, we, so we're gonna talk a little bit about why reentry, and we know that you know all of this, so we're gonna kind of breeze through these slides. So we know that you know that some 70 to 100 million individuals have criminal records, and these, of course, impact people's ability to access employment, housing, benefits, and a lot of other things. Um, and these criminal records are often accessed by potential employers, which only further exacerbates, as we know, financial challenges individuals experience while they're trying to reenter. Um, and there's just also a lack of information about where to go to for help. Um, and so the CFPB really um, is trying to fill that gap to provide you as the individuals that help people reenter re into communities with, with somewhere to go. Um, so the CFPB worked with the Federal Interagency Reentry re Council um, to, to bring this about. We also worked with a lot of other professionals from around the country to sort of create and sketch out what should be in the Focus, um, focus on Reentry Companion Guide. Um, again, it, just like the toolkit, the goal is to help those that work with justice-involved individuals like yourself identify financial challenges, and then provide actionable tools to help. Um, and so one thing that I didn't really emphasize when I was talking about your money, your goals, is that it is a toolkit and not a curriculum. So the goal is never to get through all the materials with a client um, or even with a group of people. It's really about identifying the information and the tool that best meets an individual's need um, right now. Um, and so while goal setting might be something that's really important you know, to everybody at some point, if someone is really trying to deal with their debt, then you skip all that other stuff in the toolkit as well as the focus on reentry companion guide and go right to the information on debt that's most useful to them right now. Um, and so this is what the focus on reentry um, guide looks like. And again, as Mary said, you can order hard copies of this through the website or download it um, in PDF form. And the, the, the goals of the focus on reentry guide is to help you have the conversation about money identify financial challenges to successful trans, trans, transition, and then basically match what um, content there is in the companion guide with what some of those financial challenges are that you've identified. So it could be creating goals and identifying the steps to achieve them, obtaining documents related to identification, which are so essential to um, successful transition, identifying and prioritizing their debt, including debt that's the result of their involvement in the criminal justice system, accessing and reviewing credit reports because they have such um, wide-ranging uh, impacts on people not only being able to access credit and debt, uh, credit and other loans, but also jobs, housing, insurance, cell phone plans, um, and so on and so forth. Um, and then, of course, understanding their rights regarding the criminal background screening process during the employment application process, and we'll talk definitely about that at the end. So focus on reentry is organized into these sections, um, getting starting, managing money, dealing with debt, understanding credit reports and scores, background screening and reports, using and protecting your money and additional resources. So those are the seven sections that you'll sort of see in the table of contents. And this all maps back to the toolkit um, because one of the things that you'll find is that um, while there is information very specific to the reentry population as well as tools, in the Focus on Reentry Companion Guide. Again, it is a companion guide, so if you want more information or in um, other tools, you would then go back to the, the toolkit, and that's how, again, these sort of map back and forth to one another. Um, the only exception is the background screening report. That's not in the toolkit, it's only in the Focus on Reentry Guide. So I'm just gonna talk a little bit about what each one of these sections in Focus on Reentry focuses on, and then we'll um, get more in depth into um, the sections themselves. So the getting started includes that My Money Picture um, survey or assessment or worksheet to help give you a snapshot of what's going on in someone's life as well as setting goals. And these are, again, specifically tailored for the reentry population. 
Um, there's also a new tool that's not in the toolkit related to getting needed documentation. So what documentation is needed, how can you get it if you don't have it, and what might some of the obstacles be. Um, the second section, managing money, really maps back to four modules in the toolkit, dealing with saving and then getting and managing um, your income. And so it basically tracks um, you know, how to track your spending, uh, setting up a system for paying bills, and also creating a budget. And one of the things that you'll notice, because we're going to cover it later, is that we take a cash flow budget approach, which is actually a little bit different from what you typically see in financial education classes um, or materials. The fourth section is um, dealing with debt and, um, and then understanding credit reports and scores. Um, and so again, the dealing with debt I've already mentioned really goes into not only um, understanding like debt that you may have generally, but also how to figure out how to prioritize it, especially given any um, justice involved related debt that may have um, come about during the time in incarceration. And then, um, and then there's the background screening report section, and this includes new information about getting, checking, and correcting background reports, including criminal records, um, and obviously very important for the people that you serve. The, then there's using and protecting money. This maps back to both the, the module on um, financial products and services or money services, as well as the consumer protection modules. And, um, and there are no new tools here, but, um, but it's information that can be really, really important. There's information about, for example, identity theft. And then the last thing are just additional resources that um, we think um, would be useful to you, particularly given the target audience that you work with. So that's really just a snapshot of the, your money, your goals, and how it relates to the focus on reentry companion guide. The two work together hand in hand. Um, so we're going to do, this is our third poll. I think we're doing five total. So now, um, now that you've seen what you've seen, um, at what point in time could you most likely anticipate using the information and tools from your money or goals, and particularly the companion guide, focus on reentry? Is it as soon as someone enters the justice system? Would it be at any point during their time in jail or prison? Would it be when an individual finds out the date that he or she will leave jail or prison, or is it immediately following completion of jail time or prison? So they've already like re-entered, re for lack of a better way of saying it. And we'll give you a couple more seconds to um, answer that in light of what now you know about the Focus on Reentry Companion Guide. And Keech, if you want to go ahead and uh, queue up the results. This time also gives your ears a little bit of a, uh, a breather while we're waiting for the poll results to pop up. So um, what I'm seeing is most people, um, and again, it's not a large majority, feel that it could be at any time during um, time in jail or prison. That's great. Um, followed by when an individual finds out the date he or she will leave prison, followed by as soon as someone enters the justice system, and then the last was um, immediately following time in jail or prison. Well, I will tell you that the, the, the Focus on Reentry Companion Guide was really designed to be used at any point in that process, any or all of those points. Um, you know, um, we really believe that reentry starts when someone becomes justice involved, so it's never too early to start having the conversations. Um, and so any of the ways that we listed in the poll or any of those times would be okay times to introduce some of these tools. Maybe not all of them, but maybe some of them. Um, and so um, the other thing that I want to say is that the, the, the tools themselves, while they were originally designed to be used in a one-on-one -on -one setting, can be used with groups and have been done, um, and that has been done successfully all over the country. So the tools themselves. So here's what a tool basically looks like. Um, and um, and this, this tool, for example, tracking your debt worksheet, there is a tracking your debt worksheet or managing your debt worksheet in the toolkit, but this one is designed specifically for um, people who are reentering um, because it really looks at what are some of the consequences of not paying a particular debt, particularly those related 
to, um, to their involvement with the, the justice system. And again, the tools are really designed to be used for the clients and they're written to the clients as opposed to the narrative, which is really written to you, the intermediary who's using the toolkit with, with clients. Every, before each tool, um, there's sort of an introduction, um, and that's for you. And it, it basically describes what's included with the tool, so you have a snapshot of that, and then what to do. And this includes information on how to potentially use the tool with clients. It's not meant to be prescriptive or limiting or anything like that, just some tips to help you get started with that particular tool. And then there's even a what to say section. So um, again, not meant to be prescriptive. It just includes some suggested scripting on how to talk about the topic and tool with the client. Um, again, this comes out of what we heard early on in this whole project about people just feeling unsure about initiating these conversations with the people that they serve. So a lot of the tools themselves have the clients fill things in or check, check boxes off, but Within the Focus on Reentry Companion Guide, there are what we call closer look handouts. And these are, this is just information written for you to share directly with the clients in, in a way that we hope is accessible that provides them with really important information like disputing errors on their criminal records. So just practical guidance written in plain language that, um, that again, you can use directly with clients. So it's not really a tool that they have to do anything with, per se. It's just information that could be very important to them. So now we're going to take a look at each section, and we're going to start with the Getting Started section, which only makes sense. And so in the Focus on Reentry Guide, there are three potential starting points outlined. One is having the money conversation. And so this is reflecting on their financial situation as well as their values around money. The second is starting with goal setting with them, and there's a tool that will help them develop smart goals and the steps needed to achieve those goals. And this was something when we did the initial research for the Focus on Reentry Companion Guide, we heard over and over again from the professionals that were already doing this work was essential to the Companion Guide, really focusing on this goals piece. And then the third is this documentation of identity checklist. Um, because many, many financial activities, getting housing, getting benefits, all of these things require some sort of documentation of identity. So just to give you a sort of a snapshot of what some of these look like, um, that the, the money picture worksheet um, provides you with basically a list of questions to help you paint a picture, well, you and the client paint a picture of what's going on with the individual. There's three open-ended questions at the beginning that you can see, and then the rest are just yes, no, or I don't know questions. Um, and so the way this tool is structured, will it'll help you match each client's goal or their financial situation or their most pressing financial problem with specific modules and tools within the toolkit. So there's an analysis piece that goes with this um, for you where you can actually say if someone um, answers something no, then what would be the most logical starting place in the companion guide and then potentially in the toolkit um, given, um, given everything else that's in there. Um, using this, of course, is not mandatory in any way. Um, it's just there as a tool for you. Um, and you can have the, the client sort of fill it out, fill the, the My Money Picture worksheet out on their own, or in the way I prefer, you can just ask these questions in a conversation, sort of like almost in an informal interview format. I like to share the, like what I'm doing with clients when I'm working with them and kind of showing them sort of what, what we're doing. And so it really gives both of you together a picture um, of their financial situation as well as their goals. The second worksheet, as I've already mentioned, is the setting specific goals. And by, by, excuse me, SMART goals. And by SMART goals, we mean specific, measurable, able to be reached, relevant, and time bound. Um, and it's organized for them to set both short term and long term goals. There's also um, another part to this worksheet that is about outlining steps as well as resources needed to reach those goals. So that could be a great place to start the conversation with someone instead of the My Money Picture worksheet. And then the last is, um, as we've talked about, the documents and identification checklist. So this is, includes a list of different documents that they might need um, for identification per 
um, pur purposes, whether or not they have it, um, so that's the status, and then where to get it or how to get it. So, um, so we see this as being really important, again, because so much in their financial lives once they reenter into communities is really contingent on them having proper identification. So we're going to go ahead and ask you another poll. So we've shown you the three places we have outlined for you to start the, basically to get started when you're working with clients. And so of these, um, which do you think would be the most effective in starting this whole financial empowerment conversation or journey with your clients? Is it the My Money Picture Worksheet, that questionnaire? Is it the Setting Goals Worksheet? Or is it the Documents and Identification Checklist? And so we're going to go ahead and give you just a little bit more time because we're cutting the polls off um, too quickly. So um, while you're answering that poll, I'm going to invite Mary Griffin. Um, do you have anything to add to what um, has already been shared so far? Um, just, the, just that we work with a, a variety of different kinds of organizations. So we're trying to help both people who work with reentry, um, consumers, a lot and those who are maybe just starting to engage with them understand um, how they might approach the conversation. So we're trying to give kind of different ways to approach and, and that's one of the things we heard that, you know, everyone's different in terms of their relationship with the client or the setting. So that's why we gave three ideas and there could be a lot more but we just wanted to kind of give give prompts for people um, and here are three alternatives for kind of engaging with people around these issues. And thanks, Inger. Yeah, thank you, Mary. So, Keisha, can we go ahead and see the results of the poll? Okay, well, that seemed to work really well, Mary, you talking while the polls go. So, um, we can see that um, a third of you actually said the My Money Picture, so that questionnaire that we showed you, um, followed by the Setting Goals Worksheet, followed by the Documents and Identification Checklist. That's great. Um, and again, you may, make, you may make different choices for different clients depending on what's going on with them. So now we're going to move on to the second section in the Focus on Reentry Companion Guide. Um, we know that individuals transitioning from prison or jail often have limited resources. That's probably an incredible understatement. Um, and often they're just sort of overwhelmed with thinking about how are they going to make ends meet, how are they going to manage their money. Um, and so this section really relates to the toolkit, um, those four modules, savings for emergencies, bills, and goals, tracking and managing income and benefits. And I just want to highlight the point that um, it really does look at not only income but also benefits and how to manage both of those. Um, there's also paying bills and other expenses. This is basically tracking expenses and figuring out how to pay them. And then getting through the month, which is creating a cash flow budget. Um, there are no new tools in the Focus on Reentry Companion Guide. So if you wanted to use these tools with the people that you're serving, you would actually go to the toolkit. Um, and so we're just going to show you a few of these tools that we think would be particularly relevant for the people that you're serving. So the first is the bill calendar, which can be found in the fourth module, Paying Bills and Other Expenses. And this is really just a simple tool um, to help people document when they have to pay certain things. Um, I personally have one of these in my house for every family member to see so they know when bills are due and when not to ask for new tennis shoes and what have you. And, and, and what have you. But for someone who's starting out who hasn't had the responsibility of having to pay bills, this can be a really useful, easy-to-use tool. Of course, it may, be, may make more sense to use an online version of this or an app-based version, but it's just something to help them keep track with, um, with their payments and when they're due. The second tool is the um, cash flow budget, and this is one tool that people that we have trained and the people that they have trained um, have found especially useful um, for the people that they're serving. So, you know, I've said this term cash flow a few times, and it's probably important for me to say what a cash flow budget is. And it's basically just a projection of how you're going to get and use your cash as well as other financial resources, including benefits. It's different from a regular budget in that it not only looks at the amount of money 
that's coming in or going out um, of your pocket or your household, but it also looks at the timing of those things. One of the things that we found for many people with limited financial resources is that it's often the timing that trips them up. They may have enough to cover their basic expenses, but because of when that income comes in and when something is due, things don't balance out and they feel like they're always um, a day late and a dollar, dollar short. Um, and so that the fact that this really focuses on the timing, people have found very beneficial. So this is just an, a simplified excerpt of what a cash flow budget looks like. You can see it starts with a beginning balance. Um, a beginning balance is basically cash that someone has to pay their bills. And it's not just like cash in terms of like dollar bills, but it means what someone may have on a prepaid card or what someone may have in terms of money in an account if, they're, if, if they have an account. So it's what you can actually use to pay your bills with. Um, and it's just basically listing what are all of my sources of cash and financial resources, totaling those up, how do I use that cash, and, and what week in the month um, do I need it, um, and totaling that up, and then subtracting the uses from the sources, and that gives you your ending balance for a week, which becomes the beginning balance for the next week. And that's really the idea of the, the cash flowing through the cash flow. Um, so one of the ways that we like to really talk about the cash flow is to give people a chance to kind of really roll up their sleeves and dig into a cash flow. So we're going to do that a little bit right now. Um, so in front of you is an uh, example from the training. One of the things that Mary said, and I just want to reemphasize, is that the training itself, the in-person training, is extremely participatory. There's very little lecture. It's almost all activity, activity, activity. And that's really done because we believe that particularly adults learn better when they're doing and experiencing something as opposed to being lectured to. Um, and it also helps build confidence, particularly for people for whom financial empowerment may be a new area. And so this is just an example of one of the many participatory activities that we use in the training. And so, um, and so this is Raphael, um, and he's a single parent who makes about $14.65 $14 an hour net. Um, you can see that he owes money. He has a credit card payment that he has to make. He has a student loan payment, um, and he has a car payment as well as you know housing, rent. And so one of the things that you'll notice is that right at the end of week one, he's out of money. Um, he's already in the red. Um, it, which is one way that that is often expressed. And so I, um, what I'm curious, if, and you can use the chat function to, to, to enter your thoughts here, what are some ways that you can see, just taking a glance at this cash flow, that maybe Raphael, what could he do to make his cash flow flow better? What are some of your ideas? And I will tell you in the training, we have people do this in groups, and we give them about 10 minutes to do this. I'm going to give you about a minute and a half. But um, as you come up with ideas, put them in the chat box, and, um, and I'll start reading them off. So what are some things that Raphael can do to make his cash flow flow better so that he isn't running out of money um, and resources at the end of week one and at the end of week three? And so, Keisha, if things are in, going into the um, chat box, I can't see them. So if you want to read them, you can. I see a few. One of the suggestions is that he can change the due date on his student loan. That's a great idea, to so change the due date on the student loan. And that would actually go for any payment that he has. He can at least try to negotiate a different due date. Excellent suggestion. What's another one that you see? Utilizing food banks for staple dry goods. Okay, great. So um, finding other community resources that can augment what he already um, has, whether um, one of the things that you should note, and you probably already have, is that he does receive the Supplemental Nutrition Assistance Program, which um, uh, is all for food, but for, for things that maybe um, the SNAP benefit doesn't cover, they may be available in some food banks. So that's great. Um, one pro I, now I'm seeing them. Um, I see reduce unnecessary expenses. That's great. I will say um, he is a, um, a, a single dad with two kids. Um, he does have about $200 a month in miscellaneous, but um, that doesn't seem too over the top um, given 
given, again, that he's probably a pretty busy guy. Um, but that is always something that can and should be looked at. Negotiate a different due date for rent. That's an excellent suggestion. Um, he could also research cheaper grocery stores. That's very good. Or sales or clip coupons. Uh, excellent. He could also, a couple of other suggestions, and you keep them coming and I'll just toss out a couple there. He may be able to qualify for a different um, student loan repayment program if his loans are in fact federal loans and he's not in default with those. Um, someone wrote shop around for a better insurance rate. That's excellent, very, very good. Um, some of the things that he probably won't be able to cut out that much would be eating out. A lot of times people hone in right on that, but again, he's a single dad with two kids who works a job and a half, um, so it's sort of natural that he would do that. Consolidate loans, that's another um, thought that he could consolidate. He has the personal loan payment, he has the student loan payment, and he has the credit card, so all of those things. Sometimes people say that maybe he could not pay on his personal loan. It's a loan to his grandma, which I didn't disclose to you. So maybe he could take a break on that. Um, <clears throat> so one of the things that um, get a more basic phone plan, that's a great idea, and sometimes people suggest this idea of bundling um, or request a student loan deferment. That's another really excellent suggestion. Um, so um, one of the things that um, you should note is the SNAP benefit. So it is unusual. Most budgets don't account for benefits um, in the budgeting, but, um, but we do because we feel like it is important for people to see sort of their whole financial resource picture. The trick is that that SNAP benefit can only be used for groceries. So in many ways, that SNAP benefit overstates his cash, cash position in that first week because he can't use that for anything else. Um, but there's no um, real simple way to sort of show that without ending up with many, many columns. Um, and so what I normally do when I'm working with a client is I'll circle like the benefits that they get and then I'll draw a line usually, in the, you know, like I'll use different colors for different benefits to where on the budget that can only be used. So it's really clear that SNAP can only be used for groceries, if that makes sense. Um, someone actually wrote apply for a child care voucher. That's another potentially good suggestion. Um, really, really good suggestions across the board. So one thing that I do want to say is that um, when, if you were to have done a static monthly budget, um, so just like totaled up all of his um, income and financial resources and all of his expenses, he would actually end up with a surplus of $105. And that usually shocks people. Um, and again, it's the reason that for many people, a cash flow approach to budgeting can be more insightful because it is clear with Raphael that it is the timing that um, is really tripping him up. Now, of course, more income will help. Um, it, um, there's no questioning that. But in most cases, if he were working with someone one-on-one -on -one and there was a $105 surplus, there would be like a celebration. Hey, you could open up a savings account. You could do this, that, and the other with $105 left over every month. And he would be sitting there like scratching his head saying, why is it that I can't really seem to make my budget work out? Um, and so, again, that's just sort of advocating for exploring this approach with some people um, because it really can help them see what's going on with their finances. Um, so, again, this is in the toolkit itself, this reference to it, as well as how to talk about it um, or how to think about it, I should say, um, for the population that you're working with. But the actual tools itself are in the um, – <laughs> Are in the um, are in the toolkit. So one person actually wrote, "I don't see how you get the $105," and I will tell you why. Um, you have to just add up. You don't want to add the totals where it says total sources of cash and other financial resources because you're adding in the if you're taking the bolded number, um, that's not going to get you the actual cash that comes in. You just have to add up the actual cash that comes in and ignore the beginning balance. Um, and then total up the actual expenses. And it, it is a little bit confusing, but I assure you that um, <laughs> that he does have a $105 balance. So try that, try that one when you get the slide deck. Um, so in the toolkit itself, there is a there's a, a there's a tool that looks much like Raphael's cash flow, but there's also this calendar format cash flow because we know for some people, if you show them a spreadsheet, their eyes are going to like cross. So um, so, um, so this is just a different way 
to kind of get to the same thing and looks at it from the perspective of a calendar. It takes a few more pages of paper to make this work, but it can be a visual way to kind of get to the same end. Um, Holly actually just said, and this is a really great point, um, that accounting for cash and non-cash benefits is important because as clients move ahead and hopefully increase their income, they have to cover the expenses that benefits provide. And that's exactly the rationale um, for why we included it or uh, chose to structure it that way. Thanks, Holly, for bringing that up. So, um, Mary, I'm going to invite you to add anything here, um, but one of the, a couple of the things that are really important around this managing income just have to do with some of the income sources. So, one is to find out whether or not there is any sort of federal, check your state to see whether or not the federal ban on TANF, which is temporary assistance for needing families, or the supplemental nutrition, nutrition assistance program um, for individuals with felony drug convictions is still in effect. So that's one thing to check because you sure don't want to tell someone to go apply for benefits that they don't qualify for, right? The second is that the Social Security Disability Insurance benefits are suspended if an individual is convicted of a criminal offense and sent to jail or prison for more than 30 consecutive days but can be reinstated the month following the month of a person's release. So that's really, really important and, again, might require some pre-planning. The same would go for the supplemental security income payments. Um, they're suspended while someone's in prison, but they can be reinstated the month that someone um, is actually released. However, if someone is incarcerated for 12 months or longer, their eligibility gets terminated. So again, knowing that, um, that their benefits can be reinstated the month that they're released, application for SSI could potentially start before they actually walk out the door, so to speak. Um, Mary, do you have anything to add there with respect to some of these specific rules around income and benefits? Um, no, I just, uh, except that I just, I, I guess I do since I'm saying something. <laughs> but, um, but what we try to do in the guide itself, although some of the references are made to the toolkit, if there's something specific that we think is very important, we didn't go into a lot of issues, but we heard from people some very important points like about getting SSI or getting your benefits. We included those. Um, so there's not a lot of um, extraneous material, but we're hoping it's focused and really helpful as you're dealing with people's income and benefits or whatever it might be in that particular section. So there's a focus for reentry in each of the sections to kind of um, uh, give you some information we, we just had heard was kind of critical for folks in the field to know. Great, thank you so much for sharing that. So now we're going to go to the next section, which is dealing with debt. And, um, and as we've already talked about, individuals involved with the justice system could have debts related to their arrest, their sentencing, their incarceration, or their supervision. Um, and then often, failure to pay some of these criminal justice um, debts can carry additional and serious consequences, including returning to prison or jail. Um, and so with this section is really designed to help individuals prioritize and manage their debt payments, um, considering both the short and long-term consequences of not paying particular debts, um, as well as the potential issues of dealing with um, short-term high-cost loans, um, in other words, payday loans, pawn shop loans, signature loans, um, even auto title loans, um, all covered um, both in the Focus on Reentry Companion Guide as well as the toolkit itself. Um, the, there are tools related to this in the Focus on, um, Focus on Reentry Companion Guide, um, and you've already seen this one. This is, again, designed to help people prioritize their debts. Um, and, and, and the way to do that is really using that checkbox system at the end um, where it says what could happen if you don't pay off this debt. The first thing there is reincarceration. Um, all the way through, it could have a negative effect on my credit report. Um, and so what are the consequences of non-payment? And then using that actually to help um, the individuals that you work with prioritize the debts that they have. There's also in the Focus on Reentry Companion Guide um, this checklist to help the people that you work with um, deal with their debts. And so um, the first thing is prioritizing debts, just as I described. The next is negotiating a plan or reduction of your debt. And so this is really um, tips on, you know, don't just ignore the debt. Try to reach out to, um, 
to whomever it is you owe money to, whether it's the court or a business of some sort, and see if you can set up a payment plan or even reduce the amount owed. Um, and so um, it's all, it also says, and this is really, really important and ties into the tool that we just talked about, before you negotiate, make sure you understand what you can afford because you don't want to no, no, renegotiate or negotiate something that your budget really cannot handle. Um, that would not put you in a very good spot. Um, there's also just watching, there's, there's a, the, the third thing is literally watch out for businesses that state they can eliminate your debt. It is so tempting for people when they feel overwhelmed by debt to turn to um, businesses that offer, um, offer services to fix credit um, or repair credit or consolidate loans or whatever. Um, all of those need to be approached with extreme caution. Um, and we recommend first line, always check them out, um, you know, with the, whether it's the Better Business Bureau or the Attorney General Office or, or both of those um, to make sure that they're legitimate. But then also recognize that there are consequences, for example, with things like debt settlement. If you do settle a debt, it's a negative entry on your credit report and you can potentially be um, liable for income tax for the portion of the debt that's settled. So, um, so just, again, that's like a big note of caution. Um, I'll also recommend it, however, or a step, not recommend it, I should say, but a step to consider would be visiting a nonprofit consumer credit counseling service. Um, and these, um, there's a, a, a locator um, through the National Foundation for, um, for Credit Counseling where you can find a provider in your community that you can refer clients to. So if they do, they are struggling with that, these organizations are nonprofit um, and are designed to help people with limited resources that are struggling with debt. Um, and then finally, knowing your rights in debt collection. And, um, and those are spelled out um, in the toolkit, very explicitly summarized in the Focus on, um, Focus on Reentry Companion Guide, but just understanding what your rights are when it comes to how debts are collected can, can make someone or help someone feel empowered. So that's the debt section. Um, there's also information on understanding credit reports and scores. Um, and so credit reports and scores, as you all know, can be used by landlords, employers, insurers, range of service providers, as well as lenders. Um, and good credit histories, meaning positive credit reports and um, higher credit scores, really open doors for people um, and keep costs low. Of course, unfortunately, the opposite is true. Um, so we really have this in here because um, credit reports and scores are used for so many decisions that affect the people that you're working with. Um, we also think it's really important for people to know about accessing credit reports just to check for identity theft um, and the financial fraud that's often, that often results from identity theft, as well as identify any errors that could be in their credit reports that could be unnecessarily bringing their, um, making their reports look negative or bringing their scores down. So the, the tools, um, and there are no tools specifically in the Focus on Rancher Companion Guide. These are all in the toolkit itself. Um, but again, there's information in the Focus on Rancher Companion Guide to help connect this topic and the tools to the people that you serve a little bit better. Um, but it's really designed to help people get and read their credit reports and improve their credit reports. It really does focus on credit reports and not scores because um, scores are generated from the information in reports and um, making sure that the information in the reports is accurate, up to date, that there's no um, extraneous or um, uh, inaccurate information is one of the one way to help improve scores. Um, and then finally, um, credit reports may have particularly significant. Um, they, they may be particularly significant for justice-involved individuals because of the public records section, which includes. Um, public records of a financial nature. And so it can include any kind of civil judgment, um, child support, bankruptcies, tax liens, or other debts that, um, or other debts that have gone through the court system. And um, finally, and this is something that Mary um, Griffin has done you know, quite a bit of digging on, is just how difficult it can be for people who are incarcerated to even access their credit reports. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about um, you know, how to get your, the free reports, which I think you know, but also recognize that it may be difficult for people who are incarcerated to actually get these things. So first, um, because of an amendment to the Fair Credit Reporting Act, um, 
the, you have the right, everybody has the right to one free credit report every year from each of the three credit reporting agencies, Equifax, Experian, and TransUnion. Um, and so together they have this website that really is the portal for accessing your annual free credit report. This is what the sort of the landing page looks like. And so um, uh, well, the, I think the most common way for people to access their reports is online. Um, you enter information, basic identif identifying information, and then you're asked a series of security questions which will allow you to proceed or not if you're unable to answer those security questions correctly. Um, and, a lot, and, and often that happens. I'm not going to say that that's not very often. When you do actually get through, though, the security questions, you have the choice of do you want to order your Equifax report, Experian, TransUnion, and then you can either print it out or download it um, in a PDF to, to your computer, um, which obviously brings about you know, issue number one. If someone is incarcerated, A, they may not have access to a computer, and B, they may not have any safe place to store it, or even if they print it out, if they're allowed to print something out, um, put, that, put the printed paper. They have no safe place to put the printed paper. So, that's, um, so those are some issues right there. There are other options, though. You can, um, there's a form that you can fill out and mail in. Um, and this, is the, this can be sort of a recommended approach, I guess, for people who are incarcerated. Um, it's just that you have to you fill out the form, and then you also have to have um, information about the, the, the person who's in, incarcerated, like their identification number, their prison or jail identification number, as well as a document from the prison or prison official indicating that the person is incarcerated and the location or institution. Um, and you can send photocopies. Um, and then, again, there is a form that you would fill out. The final way is by phone, but again, um, that might not be um, a feasible way for um, someone who is incarcerated. So, um, so Mary, I'm going to cue you up to add to what I just said while people answer this poll. Do you have experience helping someone who is incarcerated get their credit report? Um, and that's just a yes or no poll. And this is our last poll. Um, so if you could just answer that. Mary, do you have anything to add about credit reports and getting them? Um, well, just to add two things. One, um, going back to, to um, on the debt, debt and credit, um, just to clarify the the Fair Debt Collection Practices Act applies to um, debt collectors who come under the Fair Debt Collection Practices Act when they're dealing with consumer debt. Criminal justice debt is a little different. So always know that, that if you're going to talk to people about their protections, that those are protections when they have their credit card and other type consumer debt. With criminal justice debt, they may not have those same protections, but they need to sort of understand um, the implications of not paying either of those, and, and that's what we really try to focus on in that um, prioritization worksheet. Because uh, a lot of a lot of people don't quite remember or realize, or maybe they have to find out. Maybe they have to talk to their probation officer or someone about what their criminal justice debt may be. And um, we've heard from a lot of people that they are struggling to get their credit reports um, via mail from inside institutions. Um, and we are sort of trying to work on this issue, but the more information we get on that, the better. So either through filing a complaint or just reaching out to us um, to tell us if you have had that experience, we'd love to hear it because the more we hear it's a problem, the more that, that um, we can advocate to take action um, to get a better protocol around how credit reporting agencies are are getting um, and working with people, especially inside the institutions when they, they can't access through Internet. Great, thanks. So um, the results of our poll are in, and 14% um, of the participants said they do have experience, 45 said they don't have experience, and then 41 didn't answer. So, um, so that's really sort of interesting information as well. So hopefully um, what we're sharing with you is useful um, because, again, um, this issue of a credit report can be potentially an obstacle, one of many, for people who are trying to re-enter. Um, so um, these are actually modified tools from the toolkit that are in the Focus on Reentry Companion Guide. So one is just a credit report review checklist, um, which helps someone go through their credit report in a way that is organized. Um, and helps them to identify and hone in on information that may be inaccurate, doesn't belong to them, or is outdated, meaning that it should no longer be reported. 
because it's beyond the um, statutory um, reporting period. Um, and then there's a step-by-step -step, um, guide for disputing errors on your credit reports. This is a right that you have through the Fair Credit Reporting Act. You have, A, the right to accurate information in your credit and consumer reports, but then you also have the right to dispute errors. Um, and so this really just takes people through step-by-step -step, um, and even includes an example letter um, that was written by um, staff at the CFPB that people can model their letter on um, when they try to read, when they when they file a dispute with the um, with the credit reporting agency. Within it, there's also um, some tips. For example, while you're disputing with the credit reporting agency, while they do have to reach out to the information furnisher that um, provided the information that you're disputing, you can also go ahead and file a dispute with the information furnisher to try to help move things along more quickly. So, um, so that could be a really re really useful tool. So now we're going to move into the background screening reports, um, and this is a section that is not included in the toolkit. So this is just very specific to um, the focus on reentry guide because um, this is such a big issue for people who um, are reentering. So as many of you know, background screening reports are commonly used by employers, um, and special rules do apply, which we'll talk about um, in, in a couple of minutes. Um, the people that you're working with should know what their rights are and how to dispute errors in their reports. Just like with credit reporting agencies, um, and maybe even more so, there are many providers of background um, screening reports or background checks um, or criminal records. They, they're called different things. Um, and, um, and they can include things like um, credit history, public record information, information about employment rental history, as well as criminal records. Um, and so. If the background report contains negative information that's accurate, um, people should be just prepared to address that, talk about it, and the reason that it's not going to affect their ability to do a job particularly. If it's inaccurate, though, again, they have the right through the Fair Credit Reporting Act to dispute that error. So there is a lot of information on this um, in, the, um, in the Focus on Reentry Guide. The first is just background screening reports, and this is sort of, again, one of those closer look handouts that is designed for you to actually use with the clients and even give it to them, you know, to take with them. Um, and so it really goes through what their rights are under federal law, and again, that's the Fair Credit Reporting Act. Um, the first is just prior notice that an employer has to tell someone that they're using a background report on them. Um, and that they have to get prior written consent um, by law. They have to get their permission before getting their reports. There are some exceptions, like for truck drivers. Um, and then before taking any adverse action, and an adverse action is basically any kind of like denial or rejection because of the information in the background report in this case. So like not hiring somebody or not promoting them. Um, the employer has to give the person a copy of the report that had that information that at least in part led to the adverse action as well as a summary of their rights. Um, there's also, um, you can see that we're big fans of checklists um, because um, actually checklists help people approach information in a way that is organized um, and help them get through it. Um, the, the, there's this back, background screening report checklist, and again, it's to help someone um, spot and deal with potential errors on their background screening reports. So this can be really, really useful information to somebody. Mary, do you have anything you want to add about this checklist, or do you just want to wait to the end to, to kind of fill in? Um, I think I'll wait to the end, um, but okay. thank you. Yep, you're welcome. Um, and just like with credit reports, you want to be looking for information that's inaccurate, information that's the result of identity mix-ups, um, information that may be the result of identity theft. I mean, that can appear on um, these kind of reports. So anything that doesn't belong to the individual. Um, because criminal records can show up in these background reports, it's also potentially important, particularly for the people that um, you're working with, to actually get their criminal records, which is the underlying data source for um, that, w which may be an underlying data source for the background reports. This, however, is not an easy process and, um, and may require someone getting help from 
a legal aid attorney or um, an attorney that does pro bono work in your community because there are so many different potential sources. It could be the local or state police department, so having to go to either the jurisdiction in which they live or where they know that they may have a criminal report and requesting the report there. And then if there are errors there, trying to deal with it with that police department. There could be a state criminal records authority. Well, there are in every single state, and so that could be another place to go. Um, and you'd have to go and follow the process for your state's um, criminal records authority to actually request those files. There could be state or county records, there could be federal records, and there could be FBI records. And again, all of these have different processes in terms of accessing the reports as well as dealing with um, errors um, that may be in these reports. So this is a really, really, really big area for the people that you work with. And then finally, there is what to, you know, what are the ways that you can go about disputing errors in, again, this, the criminal record. Um, and so, you know, it's contacting the agency or agencies that submitted the information. Um, and then there is specific information about dealing with errors in the FBI record because that is a little bit more complicated and involved. So, Mary, what do you have to add to that? Um, well, I have to add that I, because I'm getting some questions, too, that I have oh, to go excellent. and look at the toolkit for. So I want to add, like, a lot of these questions can be answered. Like, um, we have one, what's the statute on old debt that should not be on reports? Well, the Fair Credit Reporting Act is the federal law on um, – what can what goes in or doesn't go in or what can be reported can't be reported um, by creditors, but um, state laws often control over the statute of limit the statute of limitations in terms of how long certain debts can stay on. Um, so it's a little tricky when you're talking about old debt, but in terms of arrest and convictions, typically arrest information can stay on for seven years. Um, convictions, there's no time limit for convictions. But there's more information in the credit reporting section of the toolkit and the accompanying section in the guide. Great. Anything else that you want to add to this section? On the, on the background screen reports, and I'm sure people have probably encountered this, but one of the things we, we are trying to get across um, through this is, one, is we'd love to hear feedback um, about our background screening report section because we know we, you know, we don't necessarily have it right. You might have even more information for us. And also, we really want people to understand that if there are errors, um, you may need legal assistance or an expungement clinic to get them resolved. Um, so it's a little bit different than credit reports, which sometimes can be a little bit easier to dispute errors. And um, we really we suggest finding a legal aid clinic or an expungement clinic. Um, if you're having trouble with your criminal histories and your background reports. Great. Thanks, Mary. And, um, and then we got a question about credit reports that actually, um, and this is usually an area that I can answer questions on, but this one I can't. Um, it's if someone is homeless and they don't have identification, they can't answer the security questions, and they also don't have um, a permanent address. Um, how do you get your credit report if that's your situation? And I don't know the answer to that. Mary, do you know the answer right. to that? I don't know it offhand, and that's yep. called like an authentication problem, which I will just t say we're really working on. But if that person can email me directly, um, I'm going to find out as much information on that as I can for them. Mary, so why, don't you go ahead and, why don't you go ahead and put your email right in the um, chat box so that people have that? If Great. Have sure, that. sure, sure will. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Great. Excellent question. Thanks. So, um, so then the next section in the focus, and thank you so much for your great questions. Questions, you know, help us learn more and help us create new tools that help other people. So we really, really appreciate the questions. Um, so um, the the second to last section in the focus on reentry guide is using and protecting your money, and this deals with both financial products and services as well as consumer protection, um, and. Um, and it talks about the different kinds of financial service providers that are there, as well as um, uh, the different kinds of financial products and services that you can get at a bank or credit union, um, the steps to opening an account, if that's something that someone that you're working with is ready to do. They may not be, but it's there if they want to. Um, and, then, and then there's the submitting a complaint um, process, which is a tool, 
as well as a section on the CFPB's website. And I'm actually going to turn this back over to Mary to talk a little bit about this um, exciting tool that the CFPB has. Mary? Yeah, and, and by tool we just sort of mean we use our complaint function um, in a variety of different ways. We use it to address individual complaints, and the way we address individual complaints, and again, this is about any type of financial product, um, credit cards, mortgages, bank accounts, um, student loans, uh, debt collection issues, credit reports, um, payday lending, um, money transfers. We, we take all those in. I'm not saying we can get them all um, addressed, but we also, what we do is we facilitate the complaint between the, the person who complains and the company. And you complain through our system and then the um, financial institution takes those complaints in through we have a portal that they take their complaints and they have 15 days to respond to the complaints and we're watching that if you file online you'll see you get a number and, and you can watch where the where the complaint is um, and if they don't respond in 15 days you know we check on them um, if there's documentation or other things they will be given more time but um, a large percentage um, do respond in 15 days and then um, we basically ask whether or not you're satisfied with the complaint, um, how the complaint was dealt with. And if you're not satisfied, depends. I mean, if it's completely outlandish, like I just, you know, they bother me, I want $10,000, we're obviously not going to respond to that. But um, if it looks like there's there's something to the complaint, we will escalate it. Um, we've just, about two or three weeks ago, we just put this new um, kind of process uh, online. Um, we just changed it, it's always been online. And we're trying to make it even simpler. So there's five, sorry, sorry. There's five steps um, to submitting the complaint, and that's where you know what is the complaint about, what type of problem, what happened, what company is the complaint about, and who are the people involved. Um, so what is the the first step is what is the complaint about, um, and that's on the next slide. Um, and we also tell you on that that page. This, these are all web pages. What you'll need before you start your complaint. So here's um, submitting. So we just ask you what the complaint is about, and you click it, and then you go to the next, and then the next. And for for folks who are working with clients, frontline folks, one of the things I want to stress about our complaint process is if you have a client, you can file on behalf of the client. Um, there's a th if you, if you go through the system, there's a third party. Um, representative complaint um, process and we really urge people to file because that's how we can kind of change policies and and look at trends and see what's happening in the marketplace there's already been I think over 1.1 million complaints filed and we look at them very carefully we do a lot of analysis of the complaints and the more we hear from the people that you're concerned about the more we can help those people um, so I just want to urge people that if they do have a complaint um, to please, if they ha have had a problem with a financial service and product, to please um, tell us about it. And if it is about um, a background screening report, you can do it. You'll see this. The second um, checkoff is credit reporting, credit repair services. So background screening reports would come under would come under that um, category. Great. Thank you so much, Mary. Um, and another tool that's related to this section is um, the, uh, about identity theft and fraud protection tips. Um, so this is, again, one of those sort of tip sheets that you can use um, with, with the people that you serve. Um, and that basically wraps up what's in both the Focus on Reentry guide, um, companion guide, as well as the, the toolkit generally. Again, um, one of the things that Mary asked me to remember to say is that when we do do training on the toolkit, like a full training, it's a full day of in-person training. And so we've tried to cover about that same amount of ground in 90 minutes. Um, we realized that we relied on lecture, and we really appreciate your patience throughout that. Um, the last section of the actual focus on um, reentry companion guide are additional resources. And there are um, resources related to all of these topics. Um, and, um, and they're mostly links that you would use to go find additional information, but they can be really, really useful in the work um, with the people that you're, that you're serving. So with that, we want to go ahead and open it up to you for either questions or comments. Um, and um, so please feel free to use the Q&A function or the chat function 
for any questions that um, that you that you have. Um, while you're queuing up your questions, I do want to read um, two comments that I've gotten. One is that um, some organizations allow their addresses to be the address for people experiencing homelessness, so that's something potentially to consider if you are working with someone who's homeless or in some sort of transitional situation and they're trying to get their credit report. So great, thank you so much, Pat, for sending that. And then um, Chris said that she had recently used the CFPB complaint function for an issue that she was having with an account. And, um, and uh, thanks to knowing that the system was there, it was, um, it was just that it was available. It escalated up from the CFPB. It was useful and helpful and would highly recommend it to folks. So there is a user of the complaint system who is very, very satisfied. So thanks for sharing that very much, Chris. Um, and um, now, Mary, I think I'm going to turn it over to you for any questions that may be coming in. Okay, I have um, one. Is there a process for challenging or changing information that appears on the Internet? I'm assuming the person is talking about um, background screening. The information that appears on the Internet probably has um, its origin in the background screening report or criminal histories. Um, it is, because we're in a digital age, it is very difficult, but the first step would be to get the, get the um, rap sheets or the criminal records and then go through the dispute process um, to try and do it. I would also suggest going to a legal aid or local expungement clinic um, if, you, if, if you can find one. In terms of where they are, which we, we also have a question, how do you arrange an expungement clinic in your community? Um, there's a lot more efforts being done to, to um, get more resources for expungement clinics. In terms of a one-stop shop to find out um, where the expungement clinic would be, um, I, again, I can't remember. There might be a couple sites, and if Deanna's on, she might know. Um, but again, if you can send me a, uh, an email, I can um, try and find that site to you. I would check with your local legal aid, and if you try um, uh, lawhelp.net or lawhelp.org, I think it's lawhelp.net, and then search your state, that's where um, all the legal aids, you should get links to all the legal aids, and many states would maybe highlight expungement clinics. At, at that at those sites yes I see San Jose State holds expungement clinics yearly um, law schools uh, we are I, I will tell you if you look up um, National Clean Slate Clearinghouse there is an effort that will be built um, it, it's sort of under construction to sort of centralize all these resources so you would have one place to go. And I think um, someone might know already, but I think they might have a map right now that might link to those. So just, I don't, I don't have the website, but if you just Google National Clean Slate Clearinghouse, um, hopefully you'll be able to get um, that effort. And I think they may list the expungement clinics but I'm not totally sure about that. I can find, all this I can find out if you send me emails, but I'm sorry. Uh, there's a lot, there's a lot of um, questions coming in in response to South Metro Career Center in San Diego hosts monthly expungement clinics. Again, it's, there, um, there should be a central place to find all this information. That's hopefully what will be happening over the next few months with the Clean Slate Clearinghouse. Um, hey, Mary, this is Deanna. Most states, um, each state has different rules around expungement laws. As Mary stated, uh, one of the initiatives we are working on is the Clean Slate Clearinghouse. It will give you the rules and regulations on expungement according to the state. But again, Mary um, gave you a very valuable resource of Googling the legal aid in your area. Normally legal aid societies or law schools or someone else mentioned hold expungement clinics. In some areas it's even the public defender's office. But that is a local effort uh, and those initiatives around expungement clinics. But definitely Google Clean Slate Clearinghouse, and it's actually on the National Reentry um, Resource Center. There should be a connection to CSG as they are hosting that website for us. Um, we have another question that Deanna might be better suited because I can't recall. Um, Deanna, on the, uh, I was wondering if the suspension of, it sounds like, 
looks like Social Security benefits is true for inmates in county, jail, or just prison. And I think it's the amount of time. It isn't whether you're in jail or prison. Is that right? I think it's just in custody. So the rule, Social Security just put out uh, Mythbuster on this. Please visit the Mythbusters as well on the National Reentry Resource Center. But your uh, Social Security benefits are not true for inmates in county, jail, or just prison. So you have to Well, um, and, Gary, do you want to go ahead and conclude the um, conclude the the call, uh, the webinar? Yeah. Um, sure. And I just want to tell people we'll we'll be sending you. Um, if you can can um, go one back, uh, Inger, in the to to show the uh, there. So um, all these resources are on that first website, um, consumerfinance.gov, your money, your goals. And I will just tell you, even I do this, just Google your money, your goals, um, CFPB, and you'll get right there. And if you want to, you can also just Google CFPB focus on reentry. Again, you should get right there. That, to me, is just the easiest way to do it. And it will also show you how you can order hard copies. Um, again, these are all free. Um, we might have a little delay with hard copies because, quite frankly, they've been very popular, um, and we need to we need to get more printed. Um, but but they will be available, if not right now, um, very soon. And I just wanted to thank you and thank Deanna and Mary and Keisha for for this. Um, it's just been wonderful to for federal agencies to work together. It's a wonderful way to get these resources out to the people who need them. And again, please reach out for anything around CFPB, around these financial resources, um, to our to our website or to me or to your money, your goals at CFPB.gov, and we will definitely respond to you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Mary. Inger, if you go to the last slide, you can see the information for the National Reentry Resource Center, where you can find more information about the National Slate Clearinghouse. Um, we hope you'll take a moment to go to the website and subscribe for the electronic newsletters. Thank you to Deanna, Mary, Inger, and Keisha for helping us bring this valuable information to the community. This concludes our webinar. Thank you for your participation and have a great rest of your day.